Ready for one more? Yes. One final one. You guys doing all right? You with me? Okay. We are starting with Peng Jun at one. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying not to go into to lunch, but I'm going to be introducing him. And he's going to begin at one. So make sure you're here like a few minutes beforehand. Um, so let me go a little bit faster with this, okay? Okay, real quick. Gosh, you okay if it's like a 50-minute lunch? Is that all right? Five minutes. Just press play on this here. I think sometimes um, we come into these, these, uh, these rooms. I know when I first got in there, um, that's been 15, 16 years ago now, when I first learned about this world and I came into it. And I remember going and hearing all these people talking about stuff and they're sharing numbers and stats. And I think I had this envision in my head that like I was going to come in and like five days later, I was going to be a kajillionaire and that was going to be the, how it worked because all these other people were doing it. And uh, I think a lot of people have that belief as well. Um, and sometimes they come in, they start working and doing the process. And if they don't get it right away, um, they fall away from it, which is, um, which is frustrating and it's hard. And so I want to kind of just talk about uh, my journey for a little bit because um, every time I meet somebody, I always get people who are like, I've known you ever since the beginning. I'm like, oh, hey, when was that? And they're like, yeah, back when you did uh, the dot-com secrets book, ever since the very beginning. And I was like, there's, fifth, there's 10 years that I was doing this before the dot-com secrets book came out. Or like, yeah, all the way back to microcontinuity. Hey, who here remembers microcontinuity? Yeah. I was like, yeah, I was, I was six years in when that came out. So I've been doing this for a long, 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 long time. There's been a whole bunch of ups and downs. Um, and one of the quotes that uh, is in the new Traffic Secrets book, Woo! this is actually the dot-com secrets book. We just taped the cover. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, we totally did, yeah. <laughs> I had someone grab and like, I, got, I took pictures of it inside and I was like, yeah, it's literally expert secrets. So yeah, anyway. Um, but in the Traffic Secrets book, uh, as I was writing it and researching and just trying to figure out the right stuff, um, there was a quote, and actually from an entrepreneur who lives here in Boise. Anyone here ever heard of ConvertKit? Yeah. ConvertKit. So uh, Nathan Barry's the founder of ConvertKit. He's the local Boisean as well. A really cool guy, someone I have a ton of respect for. It's part of an email he wrote and the subject line was, endure long enough to get noticed. They said, how many great TV shows have you discovered in season three or later? So I started watching Game of Thrones after they had released five seasons. Pat Flynn had released over uh, at least 100 episodes of his podcast before I even knew it existed. I discovered hardcore history years after Dan, Dan Carlin started producing it. This is such a common experience. There's so much content being produced that we can't possibly discover it all. So instead, we wait for the best content to float to the surface after time. If step one in building an audience is to create great content, then step two is to endure long enough to get noticed. Seth Godin is very generous with his time and will appear on almost any relevant podcast, but you have to have recorded at least 100 episodes first. His filter is, uh, his filter is creators who have shown they are willing, enough, willing to show up consistently for a long time. Um, and so when I read that, I was just like, man, that is, it's, it's crazy. And I, I um, was talking to my wife about this the other day because it's still like this whole thing is insanely weird to us. Because like this started 15, 16 years ago when we first got married and I'm sitting there and I'm like learning about all this nerdy marketing stuff and funnels and we didn't even call them funnels back then, but I was learning about stuff and direct response marketing and reading books about headlines and, and hooks and like all this, these things I was geeking out and I would try to like talk to people about it. Like I talked to my friends and my family and my parents and my brothers and everyone like trying to explain it to them. And you're like this for me, like the most exciting thing in the world. I'd explain it to them, I'd go through them and they look at me like, oh, that sounds really nice. I mean, you guys have friends or family, when you guys start talking about this stuff, they're just like, oh. <laughs> you're like, do you not understand what I'm talking about? Like, oh, and I freak out. I'm like, this guy did this, and this person did this. I'm telling story after story after story of all these people, all the people that I saw on other stages taught, telling their story. I tell their stories. And they're like, oh, that's really nice. I'm like, how are you nice not getting this? Like, how are you missing the energy behind this? Like, what am I doing wrong to convey this? And I would talk about it over and over and over again, and nobody seemed to care. But I cared. It was so exciting for me. And so after that, I started talking louder and eventually I had a couple kids. I was still uh, going to Boise State down the, the road. I had a couple kids in my classes who started listening and they're like, that is really, that's really cool. And I tell them about them and they got excited. I tell other people and, and so many people never, never heard me, right? I was speaking, but they never, they never heard me. I kept speaking, kept speaking, kept speaking. Um, and eventually a couple people started hearing and a couple more started hearing. Um, but it was slow. And the first decade of me doing this, like not, the, the, the groups were not ever big. Um, in fact, the last event I did before Funnel Hacking Live, which was probably about, probably about 10 years ago, so I'm probably seven or eight years in, I did an event, and um, we had, I think, 300 people-ish signed up for it, and I was super excited. We did it on Salt Lake. We drove, me and our tiny team, we drove down there, we showed up, and less than 100 actually showed up after they bought tickets. And I'm in this room just like, God, like, 
how is this so hard? Like, this is the most exciting thing in the world to me, and I can't get people excited. Um, but I kept talking and kept talking and kept talking and kept talking because I was passionate about it. Okay, if I would have done this because I thought other people can get passionate about it, it would have withered up on the vine a long time ago. But I kept talking. And so it's so fascinating to me today that there's 650 people in Boise on a week beginning during a holiday talking about offers for crying out loud. Like, this is insane. We're going to have 5,000 people at Funnel Hacking Live all talking about funnels and about all these crazy things that are so exciting. How many of you guys here create some kind of content? Almost everyone. Who doesn't? You should be. <laughs> Someday you will. Um, I want to talk to you guys about my process. I'm going to talk about um, frameworks here for a minute. Um, you look at Stephen. Like Stephen came into, into this world, read my books, got stuff, like learned my frameworks. And from that was like, hey, like, like what's his thing? Like, what's he going to do? He started developing. He started going, like he picked the piece that got him the most excited was, were offers, right? And he said, I'm going to geek out on offers. And he went deep. <laughs> Like so deep. How many of you guys were off mine last a year ago? You went even deeper a year ago, right? It was like, oh, this tunnel that's so deep, right? But Steve went down this deep tunnel, geeking out, studying, like obsessing about everything. And from that arose from with his own frameworks. These are their frameworks. This is how I see the world. This is what I want to share with people. This is how I can serve. Now there's 650 people here in Boise learning his frameworks, learning his processes, right? Okay, there's patterns of this. Watch all the best people. Um, outside of podcasting, I think stories are the, the most powerful way for your audience to connect with you. But uh, I was talking to, to Tony right before that. He said when his last book went, his last book went live, he did 260 interviews um, leading up to the book going live. Before it was actually live. Mm-hmm. Wow. Most people think it's like, okay, when the book's going to, you know, Funnel's live, now it's launched. It's like, like you missed it. All, everything leading up to this thing going live, we filmed so much B-roll because um, as you will learn when you, when, you, when you get the book, like 90% of traffic is creative. Like it's tons and tons and tons and tons of ads. If most of you guys, your business is at one level and you're at the next level, like my advice for most of you, if you're running a- active ads right now, is if you're like, I'll probably ask you, how many ads right now are you running? And you're gonna say 10. I say, okay, you should be launching 10 a day. Like that's how you scale the next level. It's more creative. And so we're creating the creative as the process of, of doing the thing. We don't launch the funnel like, okay, how do we create an ad? Like, you missed it. Like, documenting all this stuff so that when second the, li- the, ad, the funnel goes live, we've got a billion ads of creative going out and just like pummeling the market so that everybody has to buy the book. Anyway, that's, awesome. why, that's why I look at stuff. Like, all the process of me creating things, we're documenting and capturing and stuff because that becomes the fuel of how you actually sell it afterwards. So, so don't waste this time that you guys, as you're creating your thing, don't waste that time. Like, mm-hmm. film all of it. Like, Get your phone, like your phone will be your, every ad that is just capture everything. Keep mining all the people you off you can and build your list. Like that's should be everyone's focus right now is like using these platforms, getting people on your list so that if everything crashes, you have your customer list, you can keep running. Uh, but then secondarily, it's like when that happens and there's a shift, and media is different. And now there's not two companies you're buying ads from, there's 200. How do you survive and thrive in those markets? Boom. Okay. Use that offer mine, which I had to write a webinar, make an offer. I did all kinds of stuff just to get him there. It was a huge amount of work for me to just to get him there. And um, totally worth it, though. Uh, how many of you guys saw him there? <laughs> Super awesome, right? Like, that was one of the coolest professional moments of my entire life to have him there. I'm going to try and get him to come to the next one if I can. What did you take from that? Start publishing. Start publishing. Holy smokes. Just do it. It doesn't matter if you're bad. Right? What else do you take from it? Document the journey. Document the journey. Those actually become the ads in the future. What else? Don't wait. Even Tony Robbins had to do all those interviews before his last book came out. Yeah, he did two, Tony Robbins did 240 interviews before the book came out in order to build pressure for it. It's this skill set of causing noise, making creative that makes the funnel work, right? Because that's too often, like I was saying yesterday, the issue, we launch it, we turn rack around, we're like, oh, how come the funnel didn't work? Funnels are a scam. Like you just suck at marketing, right? There's no sales noise. No one even knows it was out. My first launch was like that. Spent eight months building it, tossed it out there. It's crickets, right? It's nothing. That ebook I wrote, I think my mom bought it and someone else who kind of like accidentally did and then asked for the money back, right? Because I sucked at the, at the marketing piece. You know what I mean? Like that's how the game is played. And so you turn, that, that's the thing I wanted to take from this for, uh, so you guys could see is how much work we really do behind the scenes to force the funnel into success. How can I remove every single variable in failure and like overcompensate for it? And uh, that's, that's how we go crank it out there. Okay, you good? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna keep going here. Um, 
it's kind of a faster one, but I just want to teach some simple traffic strategies for the show. Okay, so uh, you have to understand that content is the start of every funnel, not the first page. Content is. And it's the core of my actual business. I send the content to the funnel, cash pops out the back. Content is a campaign. Content is a campaign. You can use it for your campaigns. You should. In fact, campaigns are delivered through content. Right? You can't deliver or create campaigns or create space and urgency without any kind of cam- uh, uh, content. So when I first launched Sales Funnel Radio, this is how I did it. I was so nervous. I didn't know what to say. The first one is just an interview. Okay? And it was interview and then me, me, interview, me, me, interview, me, me. And the first probably 20, 30 episodes were like that. It was a lot of interviews I did at the beginning. And, um, and I, don't, I don't just do an interview-based show. In fact, that's one thing a lot of people ask me. Um, can I just do an interview-based show or just interview a lot of people? They do the talking. There's nothing wrong with that. But uh, I was, John Lee Dumas came and spoke at one of our inner circle things. And I started watching to see all the questions that people were asking him. And I know you guys ought to heard the story. What were people asking him? how he did the interviews, but he kept trying to answer and give marketing and business advice. It was really interesting, okay? So people kept asking the mechanics of how he ran the show, not, hey, I wish that I could tell you some more about business stuff because no one had ever heard his stuff. He, he didn't talk. He interviewed only, a whole show, everything, all interviews, straight interviews. If you want to be the interview person, just interview and you won't be asked anything else. And I, no knock against him, I'm not saying that at all. But it was a pattern I noticed, and I said, I need to make sure that I am saying a lot. I told that to uh, several people, and I was like, stop it doing so many interviews. We want to know who you are, right? And know what your thoughts are. And when someone asks you questions, it's not just about content, right? It's a big key piece. When I launched, um, oops, I should say Secret MLMX Radio. When I launched Secret MLMX Radio, I decided I had already been doing webinars. I was doing the two combo coaching program as the coach. Um, and I started seeing the power of this pattern of origin story, vehicle, internal, external, and then offer. And I was like, well, what if, if I'm selling an, a product with this method, what if I sold the show? Like the fact that you should listen. So what I did is I wrote a webinar and s- dripped it sideways. That actually became the first five episodes. Episode one was the origin story. Episode two is secret one and so forth. That sold them on the show. And funny enough, with a much smaller audience, dramatically higher levels of engagement. Dramatically with, uh, with a much smaller audience than sales phone or radio. That was huge. So now what we do, and I've had several of you guys launch like this, and that's how so many of my students have gotten into kind of the tops of iTunes on things. We combine them. So it's a combo of them where it is first, we do this webinar, basically, sideways, teaching them the show, selling the show, and then I'll go into an interview, me, me, interview, me, me, interview, me, me, for a while. And when I do that, because I still want to get people who have levels of influence above me to get on the show because you kind of list hack like that and you pull some of their audiences back and forth, okay? Uh, The way uh, we're launching this show is it's a lot of origin stories so we can kind of describe the hockey stick moment, you know, when people have failure to finally that freedom moment. Failure to freedom is kind of the alliteration we're hitting with that. But it's Russell's origin story, then it's mine, and then it's a lot of guest ones, which is great. A lot of times people try to get others on my show and it feels... I hate that. I can't even. <laughs> I just got this one a few days ago. Steve, I work with two experts that I'd like to recommend as guests on your show. Blah, I don't even know who you are. Their names are blah. Check out their website. Love to send you more info on why I think they'd be add value to your show. I don't just put anyone on. Who should I put on my show? Us. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Success stories, definitely. What kind of influencers should I put on? Where should they come from? My market, only my market. So why would I ever put somebody I don't even know, and I don't even know if they're in my market. Why am I, I'm not, it's not just, I'm not trying to make noise. That's what I say, like, we're making content as a marketer, not as a content maker. And so if I turn back around and I just, anyway, so I have a method that I kind of made up, and this is what helped launch a lot of the stuff for the second show we did, uh, was this. I call it reaching two levels up. If it's me, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> if it's me at the bottom and I have just starting out, how many of you guys have almost no list? That's fine, okay? But this is how I did it because I was in the same position. Um, is if it's just me and just a little bit of influence, I got hardly anything at all. There's somebody two levels above me who has a little bit of following, a little bit of list, a little bit of sway. You know, uh, when um, uh, Warren Buffett speaks, literally the market in the finance world sways. That's a lot of influence, right? Holy smokes. 
right? If I didn't speak and I was just starting out, nothing would sway, right? Maybe the grass in front of me, if I was close to it, it'd sway a little. <laughs> okay, but there's a little bit of sway with two levels up if I'm just starting out. The moment I feel myself begin to level up, I now go two levels up. I also level up who I'm interviewing. The opposite is also true though. I, the rule is I never go down. So now that I've had somebody like Russell Brunson on my show and other big people, I never go backwards in influence on those I interview. It's the way that I progress. Um, in fact, there's a few of his mentors that I'm reaching out to and one of the things they ask me is, hey, like if I do this, like I am worried about my positioning, which I think they're a little too worried about it. I mean, but they're like, you're not gonna go interview other people on the stuff and you're gonna make sure you talk about what I've done the right way and I'm like, yeah, okay, I get it. But you know, it really matters when you start talking to really, really big ones. So that's why when someone reaches out and they say, can I get on your show? Strategically, if you're not part of the plan, no. Like, I'm not gonna do it. This is a marketing activity, not just a content activity. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. So who has more influence than Tony? The Pope. <laughs> Who's at the top? Batman. Yes, to sidestep all religious and political debate, Batman, <laughs> right? Okay, so that's how I, this is one of my favorite growth strategies for a show. I always reach two levels up and levels of influence in my market, influencers in that market to bring them on the shows. Other reason we're closing sales funnel radio. I need a broader market so I can try and get people like Tony and big people on the shows who are not really part of the ClickFunnels market, but part of entrepreneur market. Okay. This is my other favorite method is getting interviewed. Okay. Now, uh, for the last like two years, uh, if you guys went to interviewsteve.com, there's a spot there in my Calendly that you could choose times. It was always, uh, people would like forward to 2057, be like, there's still no time in 2057? Like, it only lets you book four months in advance. Like you just kept scrolling, right? <laughs> so, but we didn't, I don't wanna always explain that every person was reaching out about it. So we just left it, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, but it's always been booked four months in advance and I'll do two to three interviews every Tuesday morning on any show. That is the thing that we've been changing is it's not on any show anymore. Um, uh, my time has gotten very small. So uh, we only do shows if you've done at least like 40 or 50 episodes. What was happening is people would get on and I'd interview and I give really hard on my interviews and then they would never continue the show. They just do like two or three and probably half the interviews were like that. And I've done probably 200, right? Now it's fine for, I mean, it's, it's planting seeds, but what happens when you're starting out in ClickFunnels, you're looking up funnel material and you start seeing the same guy on lots of different shows all over the place? What does it do to my brand? Cements it in existence. This is one of the greatest, every one of you should own interview-yourname.com. Every one of you. It's the easiest way to grow. Just get on and start talking. The moment you start publishing, you'll be seen, you'll be accredited with this instant authority that you have something to say. And what's powerful about that is people will then say, well, can I interview on this? Can I interview on this? I've been offered to get in Forbes many times. I just didn't feel like I was ready for quite a while. So anyway, but it's, it happened really fast after I started the show because of the authority that having a show brings with it. Okay, so people will ask you to come on and talk and what am I gonna say on their episode? My origin story, I'm selling them, right? I'm gonna sell them my origin story. The other reason why I stopped doing so many interviews, I'm, we're gonna start it up again because it'd be dumb for me to not continue that. Um, but the other reason why is because some people are just not awesome at the interview like every once in a while. <laughs> in fact, this happened multiple times. We'd start it and they wouldn't give me the link on how to join them. Right, and so they'd be like, Steve Larson stood me up. Like you see how people talking about that? Like you didn't tell me where to join you. Like I said in the Calendly link, put the link so I can click to join you. And I'm, like, I'm not gonna go hunting to find you. I'm doing you a service here also, right? So they wouldn't put the link. And it's, it said, if you don't put a link here, I won't find you and I'm not gonna look, okay? It's not to be rude. It's like, make it easy to join your show because I'm doing something for you too, right? So, um, they wouldn't show up. Or what would happen is I would click inside and join and they would just look at me and be like, okay, go. <laughs> like, this is your show. What, um, what should I do now? Like, do you have an intro? Right, do you, what's the show? Well, we'll figure it out. Oh my gosh, okay. 
okay, it's not worth my time anymore. Okay, so that's why we stopped doing it. We're going to instead have a little more of a vetting process where it's like, hey, have you done like 40 or 50 episodes? It's like Russell said, I'll get on anyone's show if you've proven the fact that you're doing the work because it is work and I want to know that what I'm doing goes far. So it's the same parts with it. So that's why we stopped it. Um, but we'll continue that and we'll, ki we'll kick it back up here soon, actually. Makes sense? No one's offended? That strategically makes sense, though, for us to pull those moves and do it that way. Okay, so as part of the takeaways of that, though, content is always selling. It will always be selling. That's the, pro that's the cool part about it. It just lives forever. Um, you can get guests on your show. It's super, I have never been turned down getting somebody on my show. It's crazy how many people return your call when you have a consistent show. They're like, oh my gosh, because you represent authority and power and distribution that is going to be so easy for them. You mean I just got to show up for 15, 20 minutes? Done, right? Super easy. So you're gonna get really far really fast if you choose to do this and do it consistently. Uh, get interviews, uh, like I said, two, um, two levels up. The other way I like to spread the show and anything that I'm currently launching um, is through interviewblank.com. Um, you should all go by interviewyourname.com like right now. <laughs> super, super easy. It's just a page that we created with a video and a link to a Calendly. Um, and then content is for the long game, right? You're gonna get a lot of kickback from it, um, but usually not for about six months um, is what I've kind of noticed. So that is, uh, that's how we launched the show. What questions do you guys have on this? Yes. How long are your... Could you come to the mic here? We, room got full. <laughs> how long are your interview allotments for each show when you're featured? When I'm getting interviewed? Mm -hmm. uh, I tell everybody about 20 minutes. Yeah. And I'll fit about three in every Tuesday morning. That was wild. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <Sweet>. you. <clears throat> My question might be a not question for this, maybe for your team later. But in the theme of finding your voice, even the feedback I got from my workshops is what they got out of it is not what I teach. And I'm like, OK, great. So what do I do with that now? All my courses are about health, nutrition, body, lifestyle, or business, sales message, message, story, in the business side. On the health side, they got energy, passion, enthusiasm, which I don't teach. On the business side, they got good parenting. <laughs> what? I was like, how did you get good parenting out of my business teachings? They're like, you use your kids for every example. I was like, oh. So whenever I get <laughs> feedback, there's two things I, I have a, I have a well, there's really three buckets I take feedback in. The first is a dump bucket when someone's just being rude. So I'm like, well, ah, done, moving, dump, right? The other times I get feedback, there's two things I'm doing with it. First of all, is this comment, should it influence the current products that I'm selling right now? What adjustments is, right, Play-Doh? What am I having, what are they telling me to go create or change in my current thing? Second of all, though, I keep track of all the things that people are asking me because then a the second question I ask is, Right, first I ask is, is it about the current product and should I change it? Or is it about something in the future the market is asking me to go do for it in the future? Okay, so a lot of things that I'm going and creating now are things that actually the market has been asking for and validating. So that's the question you have to ask is maybe you're being told to go do something else. Well, that's like a complete niche switch. I don't teach relationships at all. I'm like, that's my Achilles heel. Men are my yeah. like kryptonite. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, I'm <laughs> just saying, like, I don't teach relationships, so that's the only niche I don't cover. Yeah, yeah, that's the question you're gonna have to ask. I yeah. can't answer that one for you, is where am I supposed to plant the flag? Got it. Yeah. Mm. Hey. Hey there. How you doing? Good, good. Uh, so, love the stuff, but one question that keeps coming back is time. I don't have a lot of time. How do I compress? Systems. Well, I have systems, a lot of them. Need more of them then. Okay, but. I spend maybe three hours a week on this, that's it. All right, so it's literally the leverage aspect. You leverage yeah. other people, mm -hmm. but I see all the content you're creating. <laughs> is it literally because you're doing the YouTube and you're ripping everything out, and then that ultimately goes into your pipeline and then <laughs> yeah. everybody else is doing it? It's funny, right now people are reaching out saying, take a break, man, I work nine to six and that's about it. I hang out, I chill, it looks like I'm going harder than I am. So then for the two different models, the beginner versus the expert, you're the expert model at three hours a week. What would a beginner want to look at? And then what's kind of the crossover point? Great, yeah, great. Um, you know what's funny is it's about two to three hours a week was actually what I was doing on both. It's just how far it's going. I just, the systems to push it further is the only difference now. So then the last question on that would be, from the beginner point of view, how did you gauge success 
and determine when you needed to ultimately yeah. go to the next level. My first success rating was just, am I finding my voice? It was a lot of personal growth I was trying to go through. Now we're really shifting though where it's like, I mean the last like 150 episodes has been very a marketing purpose and the transition between kind of like the solo machine to more the expert one kind of signified that and we've just been dialing it down even further. So KPIs. So now it's like a revenue number. So KPIs became personal and then turned into revenue. Definitely, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, cool. buddy. Yeah, definitely. Good to see you. Any other questions? You guys good? Y'all gonna go launch the expert right now? <laughs> yeah. Awesome, guys. Thanks so much for being here. Please be back a few minutes early for Paying June. Thanks so much. <laughs>